So good evening again. Last week we had left off with uh, question, we finished no question number six and we were ready for question number seven. Now we are in 1 John chapter four and we're looking at verses, now we're moving to and looking at verses seven through 21. That's 1 John chapter four, verses seven through 21. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us, God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So question number seven here, why should we love one another? Besides the obvious that God said so, or Jesus said so, or both. <laughs> because God is love, love is of God. Did, did, did you have something, Matt? It just shows that we're part of God's team. We're, we're involved in that. Right, right. right. Love and we're participating. I heard a funny thing today where they just said, same king, same team, you know, so it shows we're on God's team, right? We're on the king's team. Yes. We're all in the same family. We're all in the same family, right? Yeah. We're all, we're all filled with the love of God. Hopefully we've all got the love of God and we're sharing that. Right. So it shows that we know God for one, two. It, it is an example. It's a fruit. If we think of it correctly, I think it is a fruit. Now, uh, question eight then, how has God's love for us manifested? Yes, Addie, I'm sorry, did I miss you a minute ago? No, no. I was, okay. I decided I'd try not to jump in because I've had a It's fine. Class is for jumping in. That's what we're supposed to do. <laughs> right. He loved us like the thing Jesus died for us. That's right. And Jesus paid that price for our salvation. Right. He so sent. We, it was God's love that way he manifested this through Jesus. Right. He manifested his love through Jesus. He sent Jesus, his son, to be that. Now, they use the word propitiation. Yeah, but I'm, Everybody know what that means? That means the, he paid it. He paid the debt for our sins. He paid the price that we owe for our sins, right? That's That's a word that... I even have trouble just saying it because it's, you know, it's propitiation. It just kind of blurs together. But nonetheless, yeah. But yeah, that's how he showed his love for us, right? That's how it was made manifest. Do you have something, Matt? I studied about that word that 
this is one of those difficult words to actually translate to, but in the Old Testament, it's actually the word used for the mercy seat. And so uh, uh, it's sort of the idea that, well, what happens at the, at the mercy seat, right? Well, that's where the blood of atonement happens, right? So, so that, that, that's the word perhaps they borrowed from that context to say here to talk about what it is that Jesus does for us. Okay. So that relates back to the mercy seat and where they had the blood of atonement there. Okay. I have studied this word quite a bit because we had a friend that uh, didn't quite understand how Christ paid the <laughs> anyway. Paid the price for us, yeah. The price for us. So John studied the word in depth and they had a Bible study just on that word. So that's the reason I know what he said. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, that's great. Yeah, that's that's very good. I didn't I didn't I don't think I knew that it carried back to that or maybe I'd heard that, but I don't remember. So anyway. That word in here, it, it uh, goes ahead. To, it gives several. But the last one in it, it says it, sin offering. It's oh, sin offering. Yeah, it's, it's an it's an offering for our sin. Right. Sin Jesus was our sin offering. Right. Right. Right, because they used to offer, remember, they used to offer the, the cattle, uh, what, the ram, the, the lambs, and, you know, they would offer whatever they had to offer and, and that they were supposed to. But, yeah, he was our sin offering. So, okay. Does anybody else have anything on that before we? Okay. So, question nine. How can we ensure that God will abide in us? How can we be positive? Well, yeah, go ahead, Annie. He's given us the Spirit. He abides in us. The Spirit abides in us. Right. Well, the Spirit does abide in us. That's true. Looking at uh, at this text, he's saying, "By it's it's almost." I guess, in a way, he's looking for that proof, that outward proof. Yes, Matt? Well, both verse 11 and 12 says something to the effect that if we love one another, then, then that's the connection there. God, God right. finds in us we love one another. Perfectly. Right. The wording of the question might not, they might, I understand what Addie's saying. I would not disagree with her. But, yeah, as far as the text goes, um, it was looking at by, lo by loving one another, right? Because that's what he's mentioning in, in those verses, especially. Um, if we love one another, God abides in us. But also, he has given us of his spirit. I mean, we see both of these things here in these verses. So that is, both of those are right. Does anybody have anything else on that? All right. Question 10, when we love one another as we should, what does it give us? Peace. Peace? Peace? Okay. Is anything else? Confidence, Confidence right? And we now... Right. Okay. So, yeah, Addie, Addie's actually hitting what they were looking for, though I don't disagree with your answers at all. The, the one thing they were really looking for was the no fear, the boldness in the day of judgment, right? Boldness in the day of judgment. I'm just thinking y'all that what they were saying would be peace. If you... If you think about it, yes. If you're if you have no fear, you're going to have peace, right? So I mean, that's why I said I do, I wouldn't disagree with what you're saying because when you believe and you have this love and you can have that boldness in the day of judgment, you that you have no fear of judgment, you have no need to fear at all. That as Christians, that would be the only thing we would fear is if we were in the wrong and we were afraid of judgment if we had drifted away or something. Yes. I know I've had uh, Mormons come to the door and talk to me different times, and one time they asked, "If you died today, would you be? Would you think you'd go to heaven?" And I said, "Yes." Yeah. And they were just shocked that I said that. Really? They were surprised. <laughs> yeah, because I had that much confidence. That's funny. Okay. Well, 
I, I, I don't really know what the Mormons believe too much, so I can't really speak to them, except I know that they have some different things. So. Well, they probably encounter everyday people across our community, and a lot of people are probably like, I don't know. That's probably the typical answer they get. Well, that's true. And even nowadays, you may even they may even get a lot more of the, the answer that I just don't believe in that. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, because there is that, too. So, yeah, good point. Um, maybe they run into a lot of different answers. All right. So, question number 11. If we claim to love God but hate our brother, what does that make us? A liar. Everybody agreed with that right, right away. That was good. It does. It does make us a liar. Now, why? Why does that make us a liar? Because you have to love your brother in order to have God's forgiveness. Well, we do have to love our brother. That's yeah, true. Have to love our brother. I, think, I think it's right. Matt, did you? It's sort of like next level stuff. So, like, if, if you can't even love a person you actually see sitting beside you and that you interact with, how, you, you honestly can't really love them. How can you truly have this more abstract relationship with God that you know that you can't see? You know, you actually fail to even interact with people that you see. Right, and that's what he's and, and that's really what he's saying in the text is if uh, if we can't love someone we we can see we can actually see someone with us and maybe we can see that they're they're suffering or whatever their problem may be or maybe they don't have any problems but if you can't care and love that person in a godly way. How can you care about someone you've never seen, you, you, you can't see, which, you know, is God? Which goes back to what Jesus claimed back in the Gospels. You know, if you do whatever to the least of these people, you have done it to me. Right. Whether they needed food or clothing or just put them in prison. Yep. That does go right back to what Jesus said, and that's one of our, that's one of our, I guess, commandments in the law of love that we should be doing for others, because whatever we do to help others, whatever good things we do for other people, that is what we're doing for the Lord and representing Him. Yes? I've had different situations where I wanted to help somebody, and they didn't want my help, and they needed it, and I had to tell them that very thing. That I'm, I'm uh, representing Christ at this point because I'm doing this because this is what He would do for you. Right. Well, that's a good that's a good way to do it. Sometimes we are we are a prideful people in America, and we don't think we need help, and we see it as a sign of weakness if we need help. And I and I admit that I'm guilty of that too. We all have that thought in our head. I think that. We shouldn't need help. Something's wrong if we need help. But that's not always true. Sometimes things beyond your control are happening and you just can't, you know, you can't do anything about it. Not everything. I admit most things are because of bad decisions, but not everything is because of bad decisions. There are things that happen to us that we don't have any control over. So, so we just need to keep that in mind. Be willing to accept someone's loving help when they offer it. Does anybody have anything else on this or anything in chapter 4 before we go to chapter 5? All right. So the main points of this chapter, I'm just going to hit that first right here. Um, in the first five verses, faith, love, and obedience as children of God. In verses 6 through 13, the sureness of God's testimony. And let's see, in verses 14 through 17, confidence and compassion in prayer. And then the concluding remarks in verses 18 through 21. So let's read the first five verses of 1 John chapter 5. This is verses 1 through 5. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. 
For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So, question number two. Now, this question is in reference to the text, because we could talk about a lot of things here. But to be born of God, what is absolutely necessary? You have to believe in Jesus, right? I mean, because you're not even going to be moved to be baptized unless you believe in Jesus, right? Because I, that's what I was thinking of. Somebody might say, well, you need to be baptized. That's true, but um, here he's just talking about what's that first step, and that's what John says in the text. Again, this is assuming they are, they are making... A lot of times they make certain assumptions that... Uh, because that's the normal custom and procedure that if you believe in Jesus, you're going to be baptized. So even though he doesn't specifically mention it right there in that verse, that doesn't mean you're you know, not supposed to be baptized. Yes, ma'am. And perhaps more specifically, not just that Jesus is the Christ, but that he has been born of God, that he's from God. And then it goes on to say everyone who loves the Father... God there loves whoever has been born of him, which we just read is Jesus. Jesus Christ was born of God, so we should love him too. And as you unravel all of this, right, right, because Jesus, yeah, is born of God, is in he is sent from God, and everyone who loves him who begot my translation says him who begot, which sounds a bit strange, but it's just talking about loving God, also loves who is begotten of him, which, like Matt was saying, is the Christ, is Jesus. So if we love God, we would love Jesus, right? That's the basic idea. And that's probably, maybe it's a double meaning too, because a lot of the theme here is that we should love one another. And so there were, in a sense, begotten of God, not the only begotten, but in the sense that Jesus is. But it's almost like we need to love Jesus, we need to love each other, and Jesus is from God, and it's just sort of swirling these ideas around. Right, and because that hits in the very next verse, right, in verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God, talking about us loving one another. So yeah, this all, this really does all go together. And it's all about how we love God, we love the Lord, we love each other. So if we look at question 3, which we kind of just mentioned, but how can, how can we be sure, or how can one be sure that they love the children of God? And it says right there in verse 2, right? Yeah. When we love God and keep his commandments, and that's, that's pretty much what Jesus told us too, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? So very much in line with, with what the Lord was teaching. It kind of goes back to the whole fundamental distilling of the Ten Commandments, which was, can all be summed down to love and honor God and love each other. Yeah. Love your neighbor. Right. That, that, is, that is bringing the Ten Commandments down to those two main things, loving God and then loving others as yourself, loving your neighbor as yourself. All right, so, question four. How can one overcome the world? Well, I think that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Right. By our faith that we believe Jesus is the Son of God, right? I mean, he said he he says it. He kind of repeats it. He says it in four. He says this victory has overcome the world. Our faith, and then in five, who is he that overcomes the world? But he who that believes in Jesus is the Son of God, right? And I may have slightly said that wrong, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So that's how we have the victory of, over the world. I wonder if he's swirling back to that idea of, um, you know, we've got this idea of the people that maybe deny that Jesus actually came as a flesh, flesh and blood human being because of some of the things that he's written earlier. I wonder if 
this being born of God is maybe in a sense talking not just that he's born of God in the sense, this miraculous sense, but that he was born. <laughs> he he literally was born too, and um, right. That's that, that's part of what he's arguing. It could be because, you know, that is how he started out was talking about, you know, Jesus was definitely a person that we touched, talked to, and we had handled and heard and everything. So, yeah, it could be going back to that because he's saying born of God. And it may also, I guess, go back to the miraculous birth a little bit and uh, just saying that he was really born, though. And calling him the son of God. Okay, so part of our part of uh, number four there, what I was thinking when I was looking at this, our faith, you know, in the Lord, knowing that our our real life, our real life is really beyond this world. I mean, this is a life, and it is it is a reality for us now. But our real life is beyond this world. This isn't all of life, and so to me, that's a big part of having that victory over the world and how you look at what this life is now. This life now is uh, what we're walking in. We're walking by faith in this life so that we can see the next life. Yep. Right. All right. We're living this life learning what we need to be in the next life. That's what I believe. That's what I understand. Okay, so if we want to read... Verses 6 through 13, I do want to tell you that my translation might be slightly different than yours. I'm using the New King James Version, and I don't know what everybody else is using. But uh, I was looking at some different translations, and some other translations don't have some of this text that I'm going to read, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Let me read these verses here. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness, in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. I'm going to stop there, because that's probably the best place to do that. Seven and eight, some translations have a much shorter version where they eliminate some of that. They say, for there are three that bear witness, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. And they skip over a lot of that. Now, I don't know how many of y'all see that in your translations. But uh, that it seems that uh, some of the later manuscripts had all this other verbiage, and they're saying that some of the earlier manuscripts didn't. I don't know that that really changes anything for our purposes, but I did want to mention it in case you see that, because that's a, a lot of difference to hear me read that and then for you not to see that. Does anybody have anything about that before we move on? I'm going to read the rest of these. All right. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So our first question, another reason we had to talk about that is our first question is a question that depends on that. You might have two answers if you have all the uh, text that I have in the uh, New King James Version, but without it, you would only have three, right? What three things bore witness concerning Jesus Christ? Water, the, blood, 
the water, the blood, and the spirit. And that is what, that's what the uh, person was looking for here in our workbook. And also, um, if you go by the, I'll, I'll call it the skinnier translation, those are the things that are mentioned. Those are the things that bear witness, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these agree as one. Yes, Pat. That's what I was talking about. You are you looking at which version are you looking at? New King James. Okay. Yes. Right, right. I, I'm not. I'm not. Um, how to say this? I'm not trying to put this down or take this away, but for the. For the answer they were looking for, I had to go into that. Plus, I knew from looking at different translations that there was going to be differences. Yeah, in, in my version, too, it would appear there are two answers. And one would be the in heaven answer, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And then the other answer would be on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. Yeah, both have three different witnesses, right? Okay, and so I looked and tried to uh, read into this a little bit, and uh, this was some thoughts I had on this. Now, I'm, this is like, okay, so I was looking at these three things, and I was looking at the three things, the witness on earth, because I was trying to look at the skinnier translation for that because that's what we were dealing with in our question, right? So the Holy Spirit, by the regeneration and the recreating of our hearts, is a testimony to Jesus as our Savior. The water, represented by baptism, you know, Jesus was baptized as an example, and we are baptized as followers. This repentance, this also is a testimony to him as our Lord, right? I'm trying to look at these three things bearing witness to him as our Lord, as, as Jesus as being the Son of God and our Lord. And then the blood that Jesus shed, and, and this was you know our death that he paid through going to the cross, only he could do that for us. His blood cleanses us from our sin, and it testifies to his holiness and purity that his blood is able to do that for us. So that's kind of how I was looking at these things as a witness. They're bearing a witness or a testimony to Jesus. Now, you may have other thoughts on that, and that's cool, but that was I just wanted to mention that. Does anybody have anything else on that question before we move on? Okay. All right. So question number six. Yep, we're going to do one more question. Six, what does one receive as they believe in the Son of God? And this was, I thought this was kind of an odd question, but... Right, right. Okay, because it does seem odd, and the answer also is odd, um... They say that we receive, um, let's see, who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. So what he's saying is, is we receive this witness. We receive this witness in ourselves of God. That Jesus is the Son of God. I, I know, the wording, the wording is a bit strange. Yes, man. So that word can be translated witness or testimony. Testimony makes more sense. Ah. Receiving the, not the witness like some person or whatever, but the testimony. The, the testimony does witness. make more sense. And that's that, you know, earlier a few minutes ago, I was saying testimony. That does make more sense. Yes. So if we look at it as that uh, we receive or believe the testimony, you know, he who believes in the Son of God has the witness if you say the testimony in themselves, because you're going to testify, you believe that, yes. Jesus is the Son of God, that, that makes sense. Perhaps that is a better word than witness for that. And it does reference, let's see, they make a reference here to John 7. 
Now if we look here in verses 16 through 18, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. And that was just that was just a reference to uh, confirm this this we'll say testimony that Jesus you know is the Son of God and he was coming on God's authority. Does anyone have anything else on that? All right. If not, then thank you for your time and for your attention. We'll pick up with number seven next week. In a moment, we'll sing All Things Are Ready. It's an invitation song. But I kind of wanted to go over some of the same stuff that we were just talking about while it's fresh in our minds about um, what John has written here in 1 John. Um, so the idea of witnesses for Jesus. So we can have uh, examples of false witnesses for Jesus, those that are deceiving us, and then true witnesses for Jesus. And so if we think back to... Um, when Jesus was being tried, you know, after he had, had all these conflicts with uh, the Jewish leaders and everything, and he was eventually then tried, which led to his crucifixion. But during one of those uh, trials here in Mark, Mark chapter 14 and just verse uh, 56, it said, uh, For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And that'll be a contrast, we'll see, with true witnesses. But these false witnesses, their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another uh, not made with hands. And, and he very well may have said that. We have him quoted in, in, uh, in John uh, chapter 2, verse 19, where he said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Uh, but of course, he was speaking about the, the temple of his body. He was making reference to the resurrection. But they didn't understand that, and they were just trying to get him in trouble. And, but it says in verse 59 there, even about this, their testimony did not agree. They weren't really getting it right. And they weren't able to bring a, a charge against him. And here in 1 John, you know, we've had these uh, hints and maybe more obvious points about the false teaching that was going on in that community. Uh, the very uh, beginning of the letter, we, we saw some references to that, you know, uh, the false teaching about whether or not Jesus came in the flesh. You know, was he some sort of phantom? or spirit, or was he actually a flesh and blood person you could touch? Uh, so the, the people there seemed to be teaching that he was just sort of some vision. He wasn't real. Uh, but of course, Jesus did come in the flesh as a man. But as the very beginning of the letter, uh, John points out, you know, uh, uh, that we did see these things. When he warns in chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, he t tells them to, to test the spirits and whether these things are true and whether they're False prophets, uh, and determine you know whether they're saying the truth. You know, Jesus has come in the flesh or not. That's one of the, the ways you know whether they're false or not. And, and of course, that's all in the context of the spirit of the Antichrist. This is pretty serious business to be teaching false doctrine about the nature of Jesus coming. So those folks need to watch out. Of course, we need to watch out too for false teaching. And so it seems like some of the folks at that time were were. Uh, there's the structure of, of how they sort of envisioned that Jesus came, that he's just some some random guy that was that was born, but once he was baptized, then then maybe he was adopted by Jesus by God the Father, and, and at that point he was made uh, a phantom or something. Like they swapped him out. Like there was this baby that was born and a man that grew up. Once he was baptized, he was swapped to be some sort of spirit. And he wasn't really flesh and blood. It seems to be the idea that they had. But then, of course, we get to the point of the cross. Well, the, Jesus can't die. The spirit can't die. So we had to swap him out again. And then it was a, a person with flesh and blood who died on the cross. And then, consequently, Jesus didn't die on the cross. Jesus, Jesus' blood wasn't shed. It was just some other guy that swapped out. And this is just some weird theory that these folks had made up. It's not what the Bible teaches. They're just trying to get this to fit their, their philosophy. But if we think about uh, some true witnesses about Jesus and some true stories about Jesus, in the, the broader story of his life, you know, very beginning of 
of Luke. In Luke chapter 1, verse 35, which we've been studying through Luke, you know, when uh, the angel came to talk to Mary, said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And this is the, the nature in which Jesus would be conceived and then born. So the Holy Spirit was involved in that. We know that Jesus was from God and he was involved, the Spirit was involved from the very start. And so, you know, as I was suggesting, there's this question, well, was there some switcheroo at a Jesus baptism where he was beamed up and no longer there, you know? And we can look at Luke chapter 3, verse 21 through 22, and, and see some things there where Jesus was baptized. And at that occasion, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove. And, and so we see the Spirit and the water involved there. We have the Spirit and the water at Jesus' baptism as witnesses. And then as we lead up to Jesus' death, and we can look at John's account in John chapter 7, verse 36, where it talks about, uh, you know, whoever believes uh, from their heart, and there's, there's going to be living water flowing from their heart. And this he said about the Spirit. He's talking about the Spirit. And that people were to, re they hadn't received that yet. And that's something to come from that point in time. So we have this connection with the water and the Spirit. And we could look at uh, the occasion with Nicodemus, the conversation there. And the, the conversation with the Samaritan woman and all these references to water and the Spirit together. But if we go to uh, Jesus' death, we could think about these things as well. John 19, 34, it said, One of the soldiers pierced his side there as he had died on the cross. And once they, they saw that blood and water, again, we have blood and water together, indicating that he died. Of course, it's through the blood of Christ that we have forgiveness of sins. And we, we see all of these things connected together. And then here in 1 John, as that letter started out, John emphasizes, as we've talked about and we've emphasized, that he's seen Jesus with his eyes and he's looked upon him. And, and, and uh, not just John, but the apostles as a group. And they've, they've touched him with their hands. And they've seen it and they can testify and proclaim the truth of this. What they have seen and what they have heard. They've actually experienced Jesus in a physical way that we have not. So we have those witnesses. We have John and the other apostles as witnesses with Jesus. We can think about Thomas, who was even invited to touch the, the wounds in Jesus' body from the cross. So if we think about the spirit and the water and the blood, and we've just talked about that in class, so it's fresh in our mind. First uh, John 5, 6, and this, this is he who came by water and blood. Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. You know, we started with those false witnesses, and their testimony couldn't agree. But these tes testimonies agree with these witnesses. So the Spirit, in his birth, with the... the Angel talking to Mary, telling us about how that worked. The Spirit uh, in his baptism, visibly there. And then, of course, is the power of God. The Spirit seems to be involved in his resurrection and in our resurrection. And the regeneration we experience through when we're baptized and, and the Spirit works on our hearts to cleanse us from sin and our expectation of our physical resurrection when Jesus returns. But these false teachers were teaching that Jesus wasn't really, had, hadn't really come in the flesh. But that's false. Jesus truly did come to earth and dwelt in the form of a man to be with us, to be with people. Maybe not with us specifically, but with the people on that day. And we received the benefits from that. He lived a perfect life. He was the sacrifice, the propitiation, as we talked about in our class as well. But how does that relate to us? Well, of course, the propitiation... That re relates to us because we can have forgiveness of our sins. In Acts 2.38, very familiar passage. Sometimes we don't think about the Holy Spirit part in there. But it's in there. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized. So there's your water. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, right through his blood. He died on the cross. That's how that works. So there's the blood. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we have the three witnesses right here. And this promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far off. And they're talking about us there. We weren't there that day, right? We're the ones who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. 
So the spirit, the water, and the blood, kind of a topic we don't normally talk about that way, but, but John talks about it, and we studied about it. Jesus, cried, Jesus died on the cross for us. He shed his blood. And Jesus told, told his disciples, and by extension he's telling us, to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And to follow all the commands that he taught them, to make more disciples. So the Holy Spirit works within us when we obey Jesus in faith. We're buried with him in baptism. We're clothed with Christ. And we become hidden in Christ as we're clothed with him. So if there's anyone that needs to do that, we would encourage you to do that. Or if there's anyone that needs any uh, prayers or encouragement, we invite you to come as we share in this song together.